this is my third time speaking in front of several of you, like most of you look very familiar through your, through your eyes. Um, I, I think the last two times I spoke here, I, I began the same way, and I'm going to begin the same way again, because every time I'm asked to speak about my photographs, I always want to say nothing and just show the images. And I, I really got to thinking, well, this is a conference about silence. Certainly, this could finally be my opportunity to keep my mouth shut <laughs> and say nothing. And, and I'm always denied that opportunity. I'm always required to speak. And, and it's not that I don't have anything to say. I am a worth, therefore I am known to speak a lot about things for too long. But um, it's because I think any time you experience a photograph, you're usually alone and you're not really being narrated at. You're not, no one's curating something for you and telling you how you're supposed to, to experience something. You just are experiencing the image. And, and I like to think that's how my images float around in the world. They're just being seen by whomever has a chance to see them. So over the last few years, I, I keep thinking of different ways to create clever things to say about my photos, and I don't know if they're true most of the time when I'm saying them, they're just like I'm speaking in front of a crowd of people, therefore I feel like I have to say something that, that sounds important. Um, and, and even if I am getting at some glimpse of what I'm really thinking about, it's, it's always in hindsight. So whatever I create, I, I'm not thinking about anything I'm going to say now. I just go out and I take my images. I've been doing this long enough now to where Whatever chops I have, to borrow a musical term, I don't. I don't sit around thinking about ah, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, or ooh, look at that, that's going to give me this. I just do what I do, and that's for me become the practice of the thing. You know, it becomes more of a meditative kind of contemplative thing for me. So I, I will say some things. I will show some images, but just always keep in the back of your mind that. This is a little bit of an artifice. I'm kind of creating a way of speaking to you about something that um, I just feel obligated to do. And, and I want to begin with that. I want to begin with just, you know, nothing, which, you know, is really probably in the end a kind of something, right? Just this the sense of non form, to, to borrow from a Japanese term I'm going to speak about uh, very quickly. And then I just want to gently slice through. So you now have something that kind of is a little bit of a form working through the non-form. And then I just want to drop those words down. Because this is sort of the, the, the way I've decided to refer to what I do. And I'll, I'll, I'll try to say a little bit more about why I call it a slice of silence a little bit later. And I want to go back to the void again. Just the nothingness that is its own kind of somethingness. And I, I want to drop in Dogen. I, I think Dogen came to something really interesting. And I'm a very westernized thinker. I, I do, because of Jason, I do dabble a lot in, in reading about Zen and thinking about Zen. But I think my mind is still kind of under control of the Western thought that I, that I grew up with. But reading this, Dogen writes, my late master, old Buddha, said, the original face has no birth and no death. Spring is in the plum blossoms and enters into the painting. When you paint spring, do not paint willows, plums, peaches, or apricots, but just paint spring. To paint willows, plums, peaches, or apricots is to paint willows, plums, peaches, or apricots. It is not yet painting spring. It is not that spring cannot be painted, but aside, aside from my late master, Old Buddha, there is no one in India or China who has painted spring. He alone was the sharp, pointed brush who painted spring. The spring is spring in the painting because it enters into the painting. And again, I'm not going to sort of prove my lack of Zen depth here. I'm going to westernize it a little bit and say, this appeals to me in the way that I think about silence. Silence enters whatever you encounter. And to make it even very fundamentally Western, you bring your own silence into whatever you see, or you bring your own noise into whatever you see, because I think many people don't have the kind of desire to look at something 
quietly or doesn't remind them of quiet moments. And I'm definitely not going to be here to try to define silence for you. You're a group of philosophers, you're a group of thinkers and poets. There's no need for me to begin to, to say that at all. So from there, I want to go back to the nothingness. I want to go back to the non-form. And I want to talk just for a second about uh, this Japanese spatial concept called ma, just M-A. And it, it fascinates me because ma, you know, the closest thing I think we have to sort of Western design that, that is similar would be negative space. But I think negative space skips something that I find very important. Because when you think about ma and you think about non-form, you start thinking about, well, what you're looking at, what you're experiencing, what you're seeing, what you're hearing, what you're feeling, what you're expressing, such things as those intervals and the emptiness of space, the void between all things, a pause in time, a simultaneous experience of both form and non-form. Ma speaks in the end of what is not there, what is not said or expressed, just as much as what is actually there. And we might think of the space between notes and music. We might think about, I studied Kiki Bana for about three or four years very closely, the spaces between the flowers and the branches in a flower arrangement. We might think about the pauses within a poem. We might think about that space that's left unbrushed in calligraphy and a brush painting. And this experience you have with this non-form, whether it's conscious or unconscious, seems to me to be bound to the experience of the form itself and the experience of the form being bound to the non-form, the two of them floating around together. And when I think about sort of the hindsight and I'm looking back at you know, where I began, what did I do? You know, we, we often like to think about when did someone start some direction they were doing uh, with their art or, or whatever they're writing. And I think it began for me the day this happened. Right? It was just this simple moment where all of a sudden I was able to take very lovely little white egret to the Golden Gate Park fishing, looking for a meal. Right now, I don't have to go in and start talking about mom, right? And when I was looking to photographers about this, they asked questions like, well, how do I put more mom into my photograph? And I said, no, you're not, you're not getting it. You don't put mom in your photograph, right? You don't, you don't come along and say, I'm sorry, that just does not have enough mom. It's just a way of thinking about what's there, but it's also just a way of working within the creation of how a frame ends up getting filled. And for me, it's never, it's never me really thinking about how am I going to fill the frame. I just fill the frame in the way that I end up filling it. I mean, I started off thinking about this when I was here, but now that I've been doing this for a while, I, my interest in, the, in technology, my interest in rule, the rule of thirds and all these things that the artists who are trying to figure out what they're doing, those things don't really matter to me anymore. So it kind of continues, right? This just happens to be a little water fountain that you can find up by the Legion of Honor Museum. Just late at night, I went up there and caught that photo. And then just a wave and light. The wave crashing against the rock. And there is really no need, I think, in this particular image to even really show you the rock. You can just be suggested by the non-form. You can fill in the rest. And one of my favorite photos that no one ever seems to pay attention to, but I just love, five carp just swimming in water, with no water to actually be seen, but you know you fill in in the non-form of that. You fill in the fact that there is water there. And then I start to think about little things I've done in the past. So this is not a bad photo. It's a nice little lovely photo of a, with the water falling um, at Cataract Falls across the way at, at Mount Campbell Pies. Nice enough, but maybe this is more like what I'm talking about, right? Where you just are able to now focus on just that movement and the movement, all of this around it being equally, equally important to the experience, at least for, for me. And here, tourist photo. All right, this is just everybody. I remember I went here uh, three days before Christmas. This is up at Multnomah Falls, outside of Portland, Oregon. Um, tourists chattering and shouting and screaming and me trying not to slip in the ice because it was very cold and wintry up there. It's nice. It's not a bad photo. It's not terrible. 
But that's more kind of what I'm thinking about, right? And, and if we're starting to talk about it somewhere in, in my unconscious of not really thinking about things, maybe that's where the silence starts to come in. Now it's just a gentle flow of light and creating just a simple plus or a cross, if you wish. So that starts to lead into something like this, right? This is just a pure field of a little bit more something than nothing than the black background. Now it's just vibrant light. But at one point, I started thinking about putting this little Buddha statue in, in my photos. It's a gift from my dad, so it meant a lot to me. I started to kind of work into that for a little bit. And then just one more. And then kind of continuing that sense of light, not much in the landscape at all. But what really was there when I took the picture was just this little fisherman just standing there out of Ocean Beach, out where, where Peter lives. I'm sure anybody who's been out there has seen many, many, many times the fishermen that go out there. And then a photo about reflection, both in the sense that you have a reflection of the person sitting there, but also that it just kind of screams out that that person probably is in some moment of thinking. I don't know what the person is thinking, but it seems to reflect someone who is reflecting. Then, rocks pointing towards that landscape, but at one point I started thinking about, why don't I stand out there? So I put myself into the picture. Now this is either a three minute exposure, so I just walk out, I stand as still as I can in those three minutes, and I just gaze out. And you know, I would say very honestly, I'm enjoying myself in that moment. And I've received many, 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 many comments from many people in the past who see these photos of me standing out in these landscapes they just say, that you look so lonely, you look so sad. As if, you know, the old pop song, One is the Loneliest Number, was playing in the background. <laughs> it's a soundtrack for the, for the scene. But it's not. It's my Emersonian moment. It's my transparent eyeball moment. It's my I am nothing moment. Right? It's just me gazing out and losing all sense of self in that kind of moment and just experiencing. And certainly I could just be all clever because it's a silence conference and say, the silence, but you would have to let that enter into the picture. Standing out, band in order. And one of my favorite moments of being alive, this is up on the Olympic coast at Second Beach, and this was a moment where I, I stood there, probably the most Emersonian moment of my life, but I, I felt in this moment that, to borrow from Emerson, instead of being part particle of God or a universal being, I felt that moment that I was in the stories. I was in the stories of the Queen people. They created all the stories for all of the energies of all of nature around them, all of the founders and the ways that you grow up and live and work as a community. And in that moment, I just, I understood it. I got it, just sitting there quietly, silently. I, I had this beach, it's 18 degrees out there with the wind blowing, so I probably felt like five degrees. I had all to myself. My family had let me go on a big journey and uh, they were, 800 miles away from me, just standing there, gazing out at this beautiful rock. So you should start to notice that there's kind of a singularity that goes through a lot of this work that I can look back at in hindsight. You have that little ego, and eventually you have a little Buddha sitting in there, and then you have a figure, and then you have me, and now you have these solitary rocks. Another solitary rock. Just things on the West Coast. It's not the coast. Very simple. That now takes me to a solitary tree that just sits on the field. Now, in, in hindsight, I just cannot help but see egret to Buddha to figure to me to rock to tree. Not that those particular objects are what matters. What matters is just the singleness in all of that, right? That everything seems to emanate from that kind of expression. In hindsight, again, I never set out to do any of this. This is just kind of how it came to be and how I look back at it. And the light. People always ask me, what about the light? You know, if I'm feeling particularly going clever, I say, well, maybe the silence is in the light. Perhaps it is. I don't know if that's true. It just sounds like a good thing to say. And then at one point, I started to realize, well, it's nice having a, a singular thing with a singular tree, a singular Buddha, a singular bird, that's wonderful. But then I started to realize, what was I doing? I was trying to, to probably in some way, I wasn't ready to have 
too much non-form. I wanted form in there. I wanted something that focused on that gave the eye a focal point to look at. But then I started to realize, ah, what's the greatest focal point at all for any photographer? It's the light. So I started to kind of think about, well, that's all I really need is just the light dominating the landscape because that's what draws us all out to do this kind of stuff in the first place. You'll be here tomorrow. That's the ocean coming into the Bolinas Lagoon. That's the point where, or if you wish, empties, depending upon how the tides are working in a, in a given moment. Just simple enough. It's enough to make me feel happy to have been there and to see such things. And then I became absolutely obsessed with the way that water falls, forms, little channels and returns to the sea. This is, this is something that we really do. I was just up in Oregon for the first time taking any kind of a trip since the pandemic really started to slowly end, if it even has begun to end. And uh, what was the first thing I did? I found water going back into the, into the ocean. And as a side, seals and cormorants are so still. I, I, I take photos very, very often of objects in the sea, and I don't believe necessarily focus on the bird when I go home and I see just a little seagull or a little cormorant sitting there and it is barely moved. Through speech. And then water that slices through forests. Water towards a rock. shape or form am I saying that my photos are any kind of an interpretation of this. I don't even know if they are of this or from this. But there's just this idea that there's a crack, a crack in everything and that's how the light gets in. And I, I will say I am very, very preoccupied with following the light whenever I can. Or even if the light's not fully there, feeling a, figuring out a way that I can draw it out in the way that I process my images later on. And just We've all seen those beautiful, beautiful scenes where it's dark and stormy and cloudy, and the light just it just insists on having its presence. It breaks through weather that should be completely blanking it out, but it just still finds its way in. And you know, you live for those moments, right? Those those moments are the great serendipitous moments of life. When you you don't go look for them and say, okay, I'm going to get that today. You're just somewhere and they happen, and you're grateful when they happen. Yeah, this is, you know, probably the most tourist-heavy spot on the Oregon coast. This is Cannon Beach. There's hundreds of people walking up and down the beach. So clearly, whatever silence is, it, it, it doesn't have anything to do with no noise, or at least in my way of thinking about it. And then the uh, clouds over Steinbeck was right. Steinbeck said you can't draw the redwoods, you can't photograph the redwoods. But you can try. You can get something. So why a slice of silence? Well, because of this. behind a tripod when I took this little iPhone video and you know a few hours later you have that. So 
perhaps just again, in hindsight, and be as clever as I possibly can for the sake of being clever because I'm in front of clever people, um, I would say that uh, I have taken that moment, right? And, and I think my exposure was a little bit long. That was a 24 second video. My exposure was probably 90 seconds. And what have I done in those 90 seconds is I've just taken a thin, a thin slice off of that moment. And even though we live in a digital world and, and much photography gets shared digitally online, uh, it, it is most certain that I still think about the print. The print is essential to me in what I do. I still think of a photo as eventually being a, a actual physical thing that someone can have. So the print becomes a slice of what had ever happened. And for me, it's often bound to silence. And I'm going to do the artist prerogative here, and I'm just going to leave these words up that I put together one day, and I'm not going to explain them. Just let them sit there. In some way, shape, or form, this represents something that's going on in my mind. And I want to end the way I always want to do the whole thing. I just want to end with saying nothing. And I just want to go through about 11 images. Because I really like the idea of odd numbers. I never do anything here. I always look for, I'm always looking for doing something that's a prime number if I, if I possibly can. So. That was for my June trip. So before I, before Peter and Joe come and read their wonderful poetry, I wanted to read three poems. And all, all three of these poems uh, touch on silence. Um, Peter and Joe will know these poems very well. Um, The first one is called The Center of the Tent by Linda Gray. Is there a lesson in the way this new silence lasts? Is it like the river's genius for making the water the same shape constantly as it pours between these two boulders? Is there some reason why the bird is always hungry and the body never gone? What explains the odor of the seagrass? Why must we bow down, yield to the flower? Maybe love is the Lord's trap. Maybe he sees us as the tree leaning over the stream. Perhaps he can't experience the difference between our pain, our loneliness, and the heron flying through the special silence that evening. And then two poems by George K. Brown. A work for poets. To have carved on the days of our vanity a sun, a ship, a star, a cornstalk, also a few marks from an ancient forgotten time a child may read, that not far from the stone a well might open for wayfarers. Here is a work for poets. Carve the runes, then be content with silence. Finally, probably my favorite poem by George K. Brown, called The Poet. Therefore, 
he no more troubled the pool of silence, but put on mask and cloak, strung a guitar, and moved among the folk. Dancing, they cried, ah, how our sober islands are gay again, since this blind, lyrical tramp invaded the fair. Under the last dead lamp, when all the dancers and masks had gone inside, his cold stare returned to his true task, interrogation of silence. This is the first poem of Larry's job. Longing for the distant shore, which of course is from the sixth birthday of the sixth book of the the end, which is often sight out of remembering. I said by Kenneth Burr, said that that expression of the dead waiting on the shore, reaching out to my hands to want to go, and, and love for the opposite shore, which they want to take care of to want to show. That's an image, that's the trope for transcendence. It's the, the central, at least in the West, trope of transcendence. This, however, is a little bit different from the whole thing. Trying to get through the whole thing. It's called After Heraclitus. Late in life, his nighttime mind remains composed of Greek thoughts rooted in the earth, wild rivers, the seas, fundamental things. Whenever a person might seek to go to learn what he thinks, whatever it is life conceives of as good. Say abandonment is the only way home. Say silence is found unsounded in the depths of speech, in the solitude of sages who breathless mutter, come, come with me on their deathbeds, who mean us to reach an understanding of what it is that quiet has taught them, why they say the past creates its own unmaking. It is May. The woods smell of fresh sap and resin and loam, with wildflowers wayside on the hikes he takes, humming an old song, I guess, from his contemplative book. See the stem of a wild rose studded with thorns that a bee heeds the call of. He tells him why all things change, what Mr. Meister Eckhart meant by all. The flowers then growing on the edge of the island Bloom like a woman with a fantastical head of hair, her tresses like sirens. Try to understand what that might mean, not what anyone has said before, but speaking of why the sun would make its entrance daily, like us exploring more passionate and dramatic lives. The gardens blush around a lake so blue that a mind, attempting to contemplate it for what it is, discovers its own, only its own limitations as if it had been attending to the cosmos or swept up by the petals thousands of sensual colors and pleasures. I think of the precious things I've seen like revelations with you, my love. A door of column flecked with gold, a pewter cup slightly tarnished, a wooden icon's amethyst's eyes, the wisdom of years passing a chorus, like the island's temple of Hera, its people no longer treasure. At Delphi, Apollo once said, my oracles are liars. Daphne flees the sun. Actin and his dogs are made rabid by the moon. Desires are like that. Seaside gray, a Mediterranean storm looms. Lightning like waves, ruins. A bare, stony hill. 
a tower rising behind it. Who wins? A boy is dashing through a field of blistered weeds, wearing torn, baggy pants. He runs to still his fear. A smoky sky means fires are burning somewhere. Every scene misleads the seer to think that what he's seen is real, yet the troubling matter of life remains dissatisfied. Feel the small pebble smoothed by rain, the wet fur of a Naxxin cat. Tell me what they mean, you who sundered me with your golden goddess. Ethics like an old hermit, not quite in sight of the water he thirsts for, waiting for what never was and never could be, to return before the last light fails him. A drunk monk, perhaps, or a spiritual fool like a crane, flying ever higher over the ridge of hills covered with tall pine, toward the moon glittering like fish's silver scales in a pond or a lane he has walked past often before staring into the wind-stirred pool in search of the face his mind's illusions mirror. No fool he then, led by the moon's reflection, to play the blind man and drown in its transient beauty. Love is born from water, everything flows, body light as air, eyes lit by St. Elmo's fire, souls burning in their sorrow. Earth is desire. Two men apart walk down the pathway, each in search of the other. They talk like the people with little to say of lives they no longer remember. Two ghosts whose bodies will mingle into the same river someday as its tributaries flood the sea near the delta while the world is busy with summer. You despise silence, randomness, the rapidity of change, but you say life moves far too laggardly. Be whoever you like. Past proves stronger. History is like a star, a scar you can play, made of pain. There's a shelf beneath the Atlantic no one has found yet, though it still affects the tides like a reef ship's wreck on that hides itself in storms. This is the wound of the past you feel on your body. You say to the sea, the grief you never can bury. In a grove that was partially burned, spindly pine trees stand alone, one by one, stark, charred, yet orderly. The year has turned to spring now. Land is lately marred by fires, quickens a new geometry, recomposes the forest. Surprisingly, holiness often begins again like these woods. Shadows of what was there before the lightning came, remade into silhouettes that time can mark its changes by. What if the beauty of the world were never spent? How violently it was created. However violently it was created, suppose our love for it was what creation meant. Near a broken oak tree, bent and splintered, starlings preen on the grass, black, spotted, white, opalescent. A man stands just far enough back to listen to them sing. One starts, the others follow. Snippets of a tune, gentle, sweet. It brings joy to his heart. It is news to no one that life ends much too soon. Make of this fact an ethics if you can. The daemon that sings inside humanity through a starling's throat, warmly, trilling, chattering, whistling, Stealing melodies from other birds, you too might learn to imitate. Note by borrowed note. One more poem of John and Jason, this is another poem by Linda Gray. Today is her 80th birthday. She died. Yeah, it doesn't matter right now. 
Um, and it's his birthday as well. So, so just by that point. So, so two more poems, is that okay? It's two poems from there. I hear three or four more. I listen to three or four more. But. A death in November from a distance apart. This is from the newest version of Scanner Last Week. A death in November from a distance apart to the memory of Bill Mayer. Riff the dusky, the sweet odor of persimmons fallen late on the forest floor. A rabbit sniffs the air through dense shrubbery, alert for predators. Men with ill intent. Two fat gray squirrels do not steer as a ravenous fog circles their giant tree. Clouds moved over mountains walking close in hillsides. Their massive boulders too craggy to climb. Sweet sounds of muted voices echo through the valley. Goshark rides past cooling currents like leaves in a breeze. The untold language of autumn resounds through woods with the silence that falls after a bell is struck inside an ancient temple, where old, robed monks chant their prayers and slowly retreat into the litanies of their hibernal solitude, waiting for snow, the end of abundance. See the Greek geese in their V flying between their habitats. Soon you'll do so too, my friend knowing how tomorrow is too late, the quickening pain, the cold. And then the last poem. The last section of the well, next to last section of this book is It's a section of dream poems, dreamers. sunrise, but no birds are seen, not yet. It is cold for Greece. The fog, pale white, slowly receding to the sea, a bitter chill stinging his eyes as he stares out far past the rising half-light. All the pure winds sound their own mournful music. He looks down at his young man's hands, surprised, no doubt, a moment's trick of the mind after a man has died. No one understands. How much the wilds of Paros appear to be the same as the stormy day he left it decades ago. Only hard weather left to tame mountains. No more wanton gods, pirates, and sails. So this is where the end is brought up, to the island where it is possible. His poetry began. To the ancient women, black hair, sand ridden exposed skin, clothes filthy, crag-faced fishermen, husband bound to the sea's cruelty, harsh life. Men may know one day they will weep and weep for, a widow, never more a wife, silently sweeping the tiered white steps, the steep paths before the whitewashed houses, while waiting for them to return. <coughs> Tragedies are these, or one of them, in the common pain of the daily Primordial, the dream the poet sees is his own, as everyone's. An old woman dressed head to toe in night black, staring out, out beyond sight, far past the horizon, blessed, alive still, still hopeful, ever faithful, ever devout. Directions, and it has it'll have from uh, Shakespeare's Hamlet. Early in the play, Hamlet says, "How weary, stale, flat, and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of the world." It's a place where probably everybody in this room has been at one time or another. And one way to read Hamlet is to see how Shakespeare puts Hamlet through a kind of energy field where he comes out and 
solves the crisis in his life. Here's another way to do it. Directions. <clears throat> take a plane to London. From, King, from King's Cross, take the direct train to York. Rent a car and drive across the Vale to Ripon. Then, into the dales toward the valley of the mid, a narrow road with high stone walls on each side, and soon you'll be on the moors. There's a pub, the drovers, or it's warm inside, a tiny room. You can stand at the counter and drink a pint of old peculiar. For a moment, everything will be all right. You're back at a beginning. Soon you'll walk into Yorkshire country, into dells, farms, into blackberry and cloud country. You will walk for hours. You will walk the freshness back into your life. This is true. You can do this. Even now, sitting at your desk, worrying, troubled, you can gaze across Millsmore to Ramskill, the copses, the abbeys of slanting light, the fells. You can look down on that figure walking toward Scarhouse, cheeks flushed, curlews rising in front of him, walking, making his way, working his life, step by step, into grace. Interesting response to that poem from somebody in England um, who was curious about the idea of grace that the poem talks about. The, the, sense, the general idea is that grace can't be earned, it can only be bestowed, which I don't agree with. And this poem is my attempt to offer a different version of it. Uh, and so he asked me, you know, where did you get this, this concept of grace? And I wrote back and said, well, you know, many years ago I was reading Thomas Merton's Seven Story Mountain. Uh, and he talks a lot about grace, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I get a letter back from him saying, well, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned Thomas Merton because I'm now his official biographer and I'm writing his life story. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. 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 I have a cabin on the east side of the Sierra at a place called Shea Creek, uh, where I spend summer and fall for the last 25 years. And of course, you know, you're in fire territory. Uh, it's always on everybody's mind. Uh, this poem is called Fire Season, and this epigraph from Heraclitus, lightning is the lord of everything. August, clear morning, a wisp of cloud above Burnside. By noon, it's grown to a thunderhead, drifting over the high country. Then maybe a lightning flash along the ridge, a burst of thunder echoing down canyon. <coughs> Soon there are strikes everywhere. One bolt ignites a dead fir, wind catches the blaze, spreads it, fire moving faster than a man can. Winds now whipping the flames, limbs so full of pitch the trees explode into a firestorm, the whole canyon on fire, smoke drifting as far south as Mono. Then come the fire teams, hot shots with shovels and chainsaws, helicopters dangling water buckets, bulldozers churning fire breaks, a C-130 banking over the blaze, releasing chemical rain. For days, the forest burns, maybe weeks. Sometimes they'll just let it burn until it burns itself out, till the forest is all char and black ruin, nothing left but scorched granite, the skeleton of trees. August in the high country, looking out from the cabin, watching the clouds fill, the air dry and still, every August, looking up to the ridge toward Burnside, where Thunderhead is now beginning to pass. The poem 
poem was written five years ago. <clears throat> and last year, the uh, Tamarack Fire came through. Um, an incredible fire crew saved my cabin, but a hundred square miles of forest around it. Pablo Neruda, the great poet from Chile, uh, Nobel winner, uh, talks about a moment in his childhood where he's in his backyard, there's a fence between his yard and the neighbor's yard, and he doesn't know who those people are. And one day he's in his backyard, and there's a little area beneath the fence, and someone, hand comes through and leaves a toy lamp. So the kid next door. So Neruda gets his favorite thing, which is a pine cone, and passes it underneath the fence. And he uses this as, as a kind of emblem for what, what art is, the sharing of things, uh, of gifts. The potato. Uh, this is from a trip to Machu Picchu in 1975, 76. Uh, I met this crazy, uh, Portuguese guy in Cusco, uh, who on the back of a paper napkin drew me, drew me a map of how to get to Machu Picchu. Um, well, it wasn't all that accurate. <laughs> <laughs> the potato. Three days into the trek, I lost the Inca Trail and scrambled around the Andes in a growing panic. When on a hillside below snow line, I met a farmer who pointed the way. Machu Picchu Ayala, he said. He knew where I wanted to go. From my pack, I pulled out an orange. It seemed to catch fire in that high blue Andean sky. I gave it to him. He'd been digging in a garden, turning up clumps of earth, some odd misshapen nuggets some potatoes. He handed me one, a potato the size of the orange, looking as if it had been in the ground a hundred years, a potato I carried with me until at last I stood gazing down on the Urubamba Valley, peaks rising out of the jungle into clouds, and there among the mists was the Temple of the Sun and the lost city of the Incas. Looking back now, all those years, all these years later. What I remember most, what matters to me most, was that farmer alone on his hillside who gave me a potato. A potato with its peasant face, its lumps and lunar craters. A potato that fit perfectly in my hand. A potato that consoled me as I walked, held me close to the earth. The potato I put in a pot that night, the potato I boiled above Machu Picchu, the patient gnarled potato I ate. Which probably is the best thing you can do with the gift. Take it into your body. Um, this is a poem that, that Nathan picked to be part of his, his incredible book. Um, I've never read this poem before. Uh, it's a poem that works on the page. It's not a poem that I think really works when you read it. I mean, there's no, there's no, there's no narration. There's no plot. There's, it's just, just kind of layers of, not even images. Um, but I thought you'd read it. <laughs> it was shot. Um, calligraphy in Calgary. I saw a man break a dog's back. Leaves on a white hill. And the moment is ideogram I cannot translate. The absolute actual tree shames my life. And pound singing how splendid the words like marble persist through time. There too, in the vortex of death. 
calligraphy of what the seasons leave to the mind, the city and the heart in ruins, the dog broken in the street, white hill leaves. To make that poem work in a reading, you would want to give it some context. I was on a train from Montreal to Vancouver, going across Canada. We stopped in Calgary for a couple of hours, and I wandered around, and I saw this guy beat a dog to death with a tuba. The moment was so intense that it was like a Chinese ideogram. It, it, it had to be some kind of meaning to it, but I couldn't translate it. I didn't know what it was. But, and the idea that language, especially calligraphic language, contains within the word itself the image of the thing that it is. I mean, Pound would believe that. It's not quite true. It's, it's a nice idea. Um, it's like the, the Chinese scholar Sam Ki, uh, who invented writing, they say, by observing bird tracks around the lake from their prints of the birds. He could tell what songs had been there. I'm going to read a few little poems that are six lines long. Um, this is titled Hasador, which in Spanish means the maker. Uh, it's another word for the artist. After a lifetime of leaning over his guitar, Segovia offered this aesthetic of craft. Not more, not less. When approaching the romance of spirit, put on the brakes. Too much music isn't music. Be calm. Let the word do its work. Allow each string its resonance in silence. When I was a, an altar boy, before Mass would be in the sacristy to be in, a, in this particular church, uh, there was a sign that said, Silence is the tree that grows the fruit of peace. I don't know. I don't know. It was the first example of metaphorical you know, expression I'd ever come across. It took me a long time to kind of, to kind of get it. All the leaves on fire coming down, uh, turning 70. Gone past the cantaloupe on the table, gone from ripe to spoiled. And only today I was going to slice it open, scoop out chunks with a spoon. Only today I was going to sit on the grass, barefoot, shirt undone, and eat sweet cantaloupe in the old spoilage of the sun. few months, I'll be 80. I can hardly wait. <laughs> Shiva is a wind in the cottonwoods. Shiva is the Hindu god of, uh, of creation, and preservation, and destruction. Shiva is a wind in the cottonwoods. Six months. Maybe those cottonwoods in the little stream and the silver threads of a web of spring sunlight have a purpose, a reason for being. And nobody, this is the truth, nobody knows what it is, though all of us have wondered. Oh, world of forms, to be in this body, this brief and only time. It got so quiet in the cabin, no voices, no music, even birdsong gone from the mountain. And with the snows, the silence deepened. This was where I lived, 
was how I came to hear what singing is. Translation of a poem by Baldo Neruda. Um, about halfway through his life, Neruda stopped writing his big Baroque surrealistic poems and began to focus on just very simple, commonplace things. He called them odes. Ode to a pine cone, ode to, to, to uh, a pair of socks, ode to the color green, ode to an artichoke. Uh, he wrote 200 of them. This is owed to the smell of firewood. Late when the stars opened in the cold, I opened the door. The sea was galloping in the night. Like a hand from the dark house arose the intense perfume of firewood. A visible scent, as if the tree were alive, as if it still pulsed. Visible like a robe, visible like a broken branch. Overwhelmed by that balsamic darkness, I went inside the house. Outside, the points of heaven were glimmering like magnetic stones, and the smell of firewood touched my heart like fingers of jasmine, like some memories. It was not the sharp smell of pines. It was not the cracked skin of eucalyptus, nor was it the green perfume of vineyards, but something more secret, because that fragrant exists once only, once only. And there, all that live in the world, in my own house, by night, near the winter sea, there it was waiting for me, the smell of the deepest rose, the heart cut from the earth, and something entered me like a wave unloosed from time, and I was lost in myself when I opened the door to the night. A couple more. Peter's one of the great experts, uh, not only in Elizabeth Pound, but of uh, almost all of literature. So uh, I'm a little spooked to talk about uh, uh, some of this, but, because the master is here. Uh, but the, the, this, is, this takes it uh, apart from a, a, a moment in um, Dante's Divine Comedy, where Virgil and Dante are coming up out of purgatory and they're approaching paradise, and it's just a wall of flame. He says, you've got to go through it. I said, I'm not going through that. He said, it's, it's going to hurt, but it's not going to, you won't be burned, you won't die. He says, no, I'm not going. And then from the other side of the flame, he hears the voice of Beatrice singing. And he's able to produce it. That's a very crude version. Rather exquisite poem. Passage. Mid September, 5 a.m., still night outside. I hear the garbage truck grinding down my street. I've been thinking of a poet who is dying in New York. How these days she reads her beloved Dante perhaps looking for something to frame what is happening to her. And who, I wonder, do I turn to? Who, in this century, do I read as if my life depended upon it? The garbage truck stops at my driveway. Two men are arguing or laughing, I can't tell, as they empty the can and drop it onto the street. There are some who believe the poem can be a guide, can be a window into a way of being. Do I believe this? Does anyone believe this anymore? 
My dying friend is reading a poem that speaks of love as a fire, as a wall of flame that the body must pass through. The truck continues down the block. Lights are coming on in the houses. It's almost day. People are getting ready for work. TVs are on. Radios are on. I can hear more garbage being emptied and then a can clanging onto concrete. I'm thinking of my dying friend, Dante, who says our life is a passage. How a voice sings beyond the flame, guiding us. How we must pass through the fire if we are to be Ascent. And the last poem. This is also from Shakri. Uh, I have a granddaughter who is fond of asking interesting questions. And at one point she said, uh, If you could be any animal, what would it be? Think of, of, of Nathan's first image that he showed us. Remember that of the eagle? It's called Homage to the Thief. In snowshoes, pulling a sled loaded with gear, I plod my way up to the cabin and find the door broken in, a foot of snow drifting into the kitchen. A black bear? That old bachelor that hung around the canyon last fall? But a bear with a taste for Tennessee bourbon, the whole bottle empty, the top carefully unscrewed next to a shot glass on the kitchen table. <laughs> and my buck knife's gone, my compass, my book of Edward Weston nudes. Well, now, Buddha says we don't own anything. He's right, of course. We don't even own these bodies that walk us over snow, that break indoors. There are some who claim we get to come back in another body, get to keep coming back until we get it right. What would this thief return as? A jackal? And given my life, what about me? An ox? A bumblebee? Dear thief, thank you for cutting me loose. Thank you for these thoughts. Maybe now I'll try to live another kind of life. Maybe I'll even get lucky. I'll get to come back as an egret, solitary, standing long hours in fields, gazing into pools, into silence. No doors, owning nothing. Standing under open sky, now raising my wings, rising above the river flying over the fields at dusk, now disappearing into night. And me and my granddaughter said, oh, I like the one about the bear drinking whiskey. <laughs> <laughs>